Now I've been running these two HP 3456A voltmeters against this digital voltage source, a DC voltage source, and just seeing how they drift and how well they track this and trying to get an idea of the accuracy of all, all of them. And I've had it running for a few days and th these were within the last one count of each other at two volts they were within one count of each other at five volts they were within about four counts but anyway then I came home and this was making a buzzing chirping sound which it's done once before though that went away so I didn't worry about it too much but I think now I'm going to have to deal with it before I can use it anymore so if we turn this one on okay we turn this one on you can hear that noise not sure where it's coming from I haven't opened it up yet but I thought before I do that we could run this test here and it comes up with minus 10 I presume that's the normal result on this one immediately we get this minus 3 and it stays there take that off turn it off and yeah it just cycles through the test so this one comes up with minus 10 this one comes up with minus 3 uh, I have to look up the manuals and see what that means but I think uh, before I do anything more I'm gonna have to open this one up and try and identify where the sounds coming from hopefully it doesn't come good before then because it's obviously a bit intermittent it's not before and then it stopped for well more than a year probably probably a couple of years so that's the introduction I'm not sure when I'll get around to actually doing it but I thought I'd record this first so I just had a quick look at the manual and the first section I found on this test function said that it didn't tell me what the error codes were but it or where to find them but it did mention the conditions that have to be present when you do the test which uh, duh, I should have thought of naturally the test will require some known specified state of the external connections and that happens to be nothing connected and the guard switch has to be in the in position so let's try those tests again the one that works turn it on press test and it should give a hundred if everything's okay that doesn't look like a hundred does it maybe I misread it but I thought it said you should get a code of a hundred but that looks like it's not finding a fault or it's stuck somewhere turn it off and try the other one still making the chirping sound good we want that test straight to the three even with the specified connections well take that out that was just the ground so it made no difference still saying three okay so we've got 10 or nothing but not 100 like it says in the manual have to look into that but I'm still assuming this one hasn't got an issue and three for this one with the chirping problem well that might be all I'll do for a while but uh, just wanted to record this introduction but while that chirping sounds still happening because it has a tendency to go away sometimes went away for more than a year last time now finally I found some more information on looking up those codes on the error codes uh, on page 858 of the manual now when you run this test if there is an error it outputs it on the display and on the HPIB interface and if there's no error it outputs 100 but only on the HPIB that's why it's not showing here and if you do have an error like this one does it shows a negative number there don't like that noise it sounds like a relay buzzing badly now when it after it displays all the digits on like that when I let go it does apparently 12 different tests the first three are digital and the next and the rest are analog so we're in the digital lot test number three which has to do with the isolation logic between the in guard and the out, out guard sections of the meter <clears throat> so uh, I've got a rough idea where to look that's probably all I'll worry about for now until I get around to opening this up I should 
replace all the power supply capacitors in both of them and also in the other two similar meters, the HP 3455s, one of which is dead. I've done a video on that, haven't done any work on trying to fix it. But yeah, I should uh, work out what capacitors I need and order it for all four meters. Okay, that'll do for now. Alright, it's been about a bit over two months since I've recorded the previous bit till I got around to setting this up, taking the covers off and having a look inside. Uh, so there's the top covers off plus these internal covers. And there's another one on the other side. And I've made these blocks that might well makes it a lot less likely to be knocked over. And I can I'll probably take these screws out and get some pins so that I can have different adjustments for devices that have different heights but it's a, it seems pretty useful for avoiding things falling over and get to both sides so to identify where that noise is I'll turn it on and it's coming from around there and there's three little relays or two little ones and one large one and I've tried listening through tubes, I've tried using solid things like a screwdriver up to my ear, touching these things, and I can't discriminate against which one is uh, causing the noise, but from the racket I'm, I'm thinking it must be the big one, but we'll find out. So I'll turn that off because I don't like it doing that. But uh, I thought, let's just take a moment to admire the beauty of the engineering of these things. Yeah, so I'll just do a brief description of how these things are laid out. Like most bench multimeters, it has two separate electrically isolated sections called the outguard and the inguard. The outguard controls the front panel. It has the external interface for the HPIB, and it's pretty much at, at frame ground potential. The, the naught volts on, in the outguard is connected to the frame ground and that's also mostly digital then there's the in-guard section which is mostly analog and it's electrically isolated in fact it, it lives in a shielded case and see there's these two so there's this internal case here and that's electrically isolated from the outside frame and it has covers and there's another cover on the other side so that it's all shielded and it can operate at a different at non ground potential. This whole internal frame for the in guard section is connected to the guard terminal, and that guard terminal can be up to 500 volts from the earthed frame ground, and there can be up to 350 volts between the guard terminal and the low analog input. And you can have up to a thousand volts between low and high inputs, so you know, nearly 1800 volts between that and frame ground. The two sections communicate with each other via these pulse transformers. There's little ferrite cores with, with a, a primary wound on them, and the secondaries are just a single turn. There's a clock and a data from this one to send signals to here, and likewise for this one to send signals to there. They also have separate power supplies. The outguard just needs 5 volts, so there's a filter capacitor for it. There's supposed to be four diodes up there for the bridge rectifier, but they're not fitted. And it looks like a centre tapped power supply with uh, just two diodes in there bolted to the back panel for a heatsink, and also the regulator is down there. So it's just slightly there's been a slight modification since this board was designed. The in-guard, however, needs several power supplies. It's got plus 5, plus and minus 15, uh, minus 18, plus 33, I think that's it. And because this can float, it's in a separate section. There's, there's the power supply for the in-guard there. There are two separate secondaries on the transformer, one for the out-guard, 5 volt supply and another one or more windings that go to the in guard power supply and of course because this can be at such a high voltage difference to ground it's a special transformer it has to have very good insulation between those two sets of secondaries 
and there's also an electrostatic shield between them to stop a racket from here or the mains getting into this power supply or to reduce the racket. Now removing these protective plates over that area we can see that the rectifiers that were up here have been replaced by a bridge rectifier there and there's the 5 volt regulator it's a LM323K 5 volts 3 amps and in earlier revisions so that area there had a fan which is obviously wasn't necessary and has been removed and the diodes were here and the regulator was mounted on a plate between these two boards here but there's no plate there now so yeah a revision now let's have a look at the boards in these two sections they're named A1234 for the out guard and A1020 30 40 for the in guard the A1 is this board here which goes to the HPIB or GPIB interface there's address switches there's also a couple of BNC's one's a trigger input to start a measurement and another one to indicate a measurement's been completed we've also got duplicate terminals on the back and the switch at the front selects whether the inputs come from here or the front panel there's where the fan was there's uh, bolts for those rectifiers and there's the LM325K 5 volt regulator for the outguard supply so yeah that's 8A1 then we've got A2 which is the front panel board along the, right along there then A3 which is called the outguard isolation up here there's a filter for the 5 volt supply and the last one in the outguard is the main controller A4 here that's a 6800 microprocessor, a 68A00, so it's a 1.5 megahertz version, and it needs a clock generator chip, which I think is that, 6875, and a crystal. Then the in guard section starts with A10, which is this power supply here. All the caps look okay on that, so maybe I don't have to replace them. We'll check the ripple on the supplies with the oscilloscope. A20 is this big boy here. There's lots of sections. We'll have a look at those in a minute. Then on the other side, we have A30. This is A30 here. It's got another microprocessor. That's a 8048, which contains the ROM and RAM, and it's been mass programmed, so it could be a bugger to replace if it fails. And, and that's the in-guard controller. And A40 is the AC converted converts AC to true RMS DC for measurement and uh, yeah if we look at the analog section we've got a few bit few bits of unobtainium this thing here there's a couple on the other side another relay there too didn't notice that before uh, and you can see everything so beautifully done we've got the gold plating everywhere there's lots of sections here with air connections to uh, Teflon inserts into the PCB for very high isolation resistance so that the circuit board's uh, resistance doesn't cause a problem there's on the A2 board we can see two more bits of unobtainium and there's the reference voltage reference using an LM399 uh, again we've got air wiring and Teflon inserts in the PCB these, these white lines indicate the sections this is the input switching obviously with the relays switching then the input amplifier is here that's the ADC analog to digital converter there this is logic which controls the relays so this is the area we'll have to look at for trying to work out what's going on with that noise uh, this here is the ohms current supply and this here is calibration adjustments which are accessible from the front panel accessible behind a plate on the front panel and yes beautiful now these boards can be removed fairly easily apparently uh, you just undo screws like the top board you just undo the screws that are holding it down disconnect any external connections and then just pull these things out and the board can come off but uh, most boards only have two of those but the 
A20 board has seven of them. So yeah. Uh, all right, that, that, that pretty much covers a brief description of this thing and a look at the niceness of it. So I'll lay this down and start looking at power supply voltages here and the collectors of these transistors which are what drives these three relays and see if there's any noise on them that, that explains that chattering and they're driven from this IO port expander and we'll look at the outputs of that and see if that's where the chattering is coming from and if it's somewhere back further from the controller, uh, well, <laughs> that could be a worry. Hmm. Right, I think I've discovered a problem. To show you what I've done, I've got just a crappy little multimeter acting as a continuity tester. If I measure between the guard frame, for the in guard frame, and the outside there's nothing, as expected. If we go to the ground pin on this connector here, there's nothing, but if I press on the front panel, the switch that connects the low input terminal to the guard, then we get a connection. So I can use the guard frame as a ground for the oscilloscope. And doing that, and I've got it in times 10 mode, and I've told, oops, I've told the oscilloscope it's in times 10. So turning on the power, and I'll measure these voltages on this terminal strip here, this interconnecting strip. We have our chirpy relay, minus 18 volts, that's at 20 volts per division, 10 volts division, see up there, 17.2 volts, that's pretty good, 15, 10 volts division, that's about right, 14 point naught, the other end, 33, it can be 33 to 43, so that's okay. Plus 15 shows us 16.8. But the 5 volts, which are the two middle ones, looks like we've got a fair bit of ripple. And they come into 2 volts per division. So we've got a peak at 5 volts, but the bottom is looking pretty bad. Looks like our 5 volt power supply for the in guard is cactus. So I'll suss around in there and see what I can find out. But yeah, that certainly seems to explain misbehaviour in here, nothing in there should be working properly. Okay, I'll investigate the, the power supply. Well, given all that really bad ripple on the 5 volt power supply for the in-guard section, the obvious suspect is this guy, which is the filter capacitor for the 5 volt supply. 4000 microfarads, 15 volts DC, and if we get this guy to have a look at it. Not even there. So it's gone open circuit virtually. So yeah, that's an X capacitor. Now, the only thing I can find in my piles of stuff is this, which looks positively puny by comparison, but it's it's bigger, it's got higher voltage and higher capacitance. Uh, so I had a, a bunch of these, so I've put one of them in. There he is. And now we can try turning it on. Power on. No clattering. Looks like it works. Press the test. They come on. And it goes through its 12 step testing and comes back with no errors, so beauty! Looks like that's done it now. Obviously that makes every power supply capacitor in all four of these types of boxes I've got, so I will be looking for something to replace them all. I look for something more substantial than this, maybe a 25 or 35 volt 4700 to replace this, and yeah. So that was a bit of an anti-climax, makes me all wonder what was it worth even making a video but we got to see what's going on inside this thing so I think it was and uh, hope you enjoyed it and if you don't like this video why are you watching it catch you later